All year, the flax dam festered in the heart of the townland. Green and heavy-headed flax had rotted there, weighed down by huge sods. Daily it sweltered in the punishing sun. Bubbles gargled delicately. Blue bottles wove a strong gauze of sound around the smell. There were dragonflies, spotted butterflies, but best of all was the warm, thick slobber of frog spawn that grew like clotted water in the shade of the banks. Here, every spring, I would fill jam pots of the jellied specks to range on windowsills at home, on shelves at school, and wait and watch until the fattening dots burst into nimble swimming tadpoles. Miss Walls would tell us how the daddy frog was called a bullfrog, and how he croaked and how the mammy frog laid hundreds of little eggs and this was frog spawn. You could tell the weather by frogs too, for they were yellow in the sun and brown in rain. Death of a Naturalist Episode 3 of Professing Literature, coming to you this week from Norman, Oklahoma, in the autumn. It's a cool, gray, windy day in the year of grace 2020. Professing Literature is the podcast where we look closely at short passages of important works of literature in the hopes of seeing writers in action. We aim to work across literary genres and modes, whether comedy or tragedy, drama, poetry, or fiction looking at the dynamics of a passage in order to understand what's going on, what the author is doing, and what is at stake in those few lines for the work as a whole, the issues that are clarified, the techniques that are involved. I am David Anderson, Associate Professor of Renaissance Literature at the University of Oklahoma, and I am joined, as always, by Mr. Eric Williams, Esquire. Hello, Eric. Hello, hello. How are you, David? Not too bad. Um, it feels good to be back in harness, actually. We've had a little time away just as we started getting this podcast off the ground. We uh, had to take a break, and now we're back, and it feels good to be back and to uh, be uh, teeing up the third episode. Yeah, I'm excited. I could just listen to you talk for hours, David. Oh, that's not what my students say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is this is exciting for me. Um, and I think for both Eric and I, it's it's kind of a passion project that we really hope we can get somewhere with and build up a little body of work. Um, it's uh, it's just exciting for me to talk about literature and doing it in this way, where you're not just zooming back and talking very broadly, but really getting into the nitty gritty is fun and interesting and engaging for me at least. And I think that's where I always see students sort of lean forward the most often in the classroom is where we really start doing this kind of work. So I hope uh, you, the listener, find it engaging also. I'm uh, just grateful Eric came to me with this idea and we, we kicked it around for a while and did some thinking about what kind of format would work well for this. And the idea of doing these little close readings had a lot of appeal for me. So as the, uh, as the numbers mount and as we uh, start breaking records for listenership and things like that, oh, yeah. hopefully, yeah, that's, uh, we've got a long-term plan. Yeah. And uh, these are early days, but. And sponsors will be banging down the doors. Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's the idea. I'm not saying I want to be able to retire based on the podcast revenues, (laughs) but uh, yeah, um, there might be some really interesting sort of bidding wars, things like that, um, because we've only got so much airtime, everyone, and uh, the sponsors will have to um, show by the size of the checks they're willing to write how badly they want to be associated with our brand. Um, these, these, These are the initial baby steps, but we will grow strong. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, 
I chose something that takes me a little bit out of my comfort zone. Macbeth is something I think I can say I know very, very well. And even though I'm a Renaissance literature specialist and Shakespeare is a big part of my bread and butter, I know Jane Austen really well. I love Jane Austen passionately um, and have read her novels, most of her novels, more times than I can probably remember. Um, But we're dealing with a writer today who's a little bit different, Um, a writer I admire and like, but profess no expertise in. Um, Hopefully, I'm able to read him with a certain amount of skill and say things about these po- this poem that is, that is interesting, but I don't pretend to be a Seamus Heaney expert, but Seamus Heaney is our subject. So we're dealing with someone who's a contemporary writer, someone who only died in 2013, may he rest in peace, uh, someone who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995, and while he was alive, was one of the, the best-known and most celebrated living poets in the English-speaking world. I've long admired Heaney, um, but only as someone who dipped in on occasion. Um, I've uh, I've taught a little bit of his poetry before in classes from time to time, but never, never done like a unit on him, much less ever studied him in depth. But Heaney is uh, a proud representative of the great tradition of Irish poetry. He came from a Catholic family in Protestant Northern Ireland from County Derry growing up in the middle of the 20th century. And the poem we're going to talk about today is from his first volume of poetry, a celebrated volume that really put him on the map called Death of a Naturalist. It's a collection of lyric poems that emphasizes Haney's origin in the countryside of Northern Ireland. And a lot of the collection is about childhood experience and how um, childhood experience shapes the adult for good and ill. And today, we'll talk a little bit about the poem I began the episode with, um, the poem from which the collection's title is taken, Death of a Naturalist. But most of our uh, focus will be on blackberry picking, which is uh, one of the lyrics from this collection. I, just, I love this poem. It's, um, I think it's moving. It's tight and extremely well-constructed. Every word of it seems necessary. It seems like there's nothing in the poem that's unnecessary. It's a beautiful observation of something that I think everyone can find resonant, something important that matters to all of us and that all of us can identify with in one way or another, even if we don't have a childhood memory of blackberry picking. It's about growing up. It's about leaving childhood behind. And yet there's nothing cloying or sentimental or puff the magic dragon about the poem. It's about, in a very kind of um, delicately handled way, I think, it's about the dawning of sexuality in one's mind and the idea that the world all of a sudden for the 11, 12, 13-year-old child starts to become a more difficult, complex, complicated, and unnerving place than maybe he or she originally thought it was. It's even deeper than that, though. This poem is speaking to the fact that we aren't at home in the world as much as we would like to be that reality doesn't obey our desires, at least not most of the time. It's about how things change in ways that we don't like and wish weren't so. It's about how in life we tend to reach for something and it changes shape even as we grasp it or it slips away. And growing up means coming to terms with that and figuring out a way to move forward in spite of that. But Blackberry Picking, the poem, zeroes in on that moment or one of those moments, one of those poignant moments in childhood where we start to feel that growing awareness of the slipperiness of life and the fact that change means things will not be as we might wish them to be. Haney tells a little story in this poem. And because of the way he tells it, it has a power 
that abstract rumination does not have. So in other words, you or I, Eric, could talk um, in abstract terms about the growth to maturity, about a feeling of wistfulness that rises um, out of the fact that a child confronts life in its brokenness. And we might say interesting, powerful things, but this little story has an ability to say all that, but to sound it at the deeper levels. And another thing I love about the poem and that I hope I can bring out is that there's a really artful simplicity in it. Heaney has taken, um, and I'm horribly inconsistent and sloppy with pronunciation, so I'll probably call him Heaney or Haney. I can't remember. I think it's, I think, um, Seamus Haney is how you're supposed to say his name. So forgive me if you're his relative uh, for my sloppy pronunciation. But one of, the, one of the powerful things art can do is to take an ordinary event or even a sinister event or even an ugly event and convey the truth of that event in its sordidness or ugliness and yet do so in a way that makes it beautiful or that makes the object itself at least beautiful. And Haney does that here. And so none of the kind of darkness of this event and what it represents in the life of a child is lost. There's no sugarcoating in this poem, but um, beauty is conveyed as he does it. All right, so... Uh, the way this poem is constructed, so, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be fairly general at first. A lot of poetry is written with stanzas. So, in other words, the poem unfolds across regular stanzaic units where there is a set rhyme scheme. And so the equivalent to verses in a song, when we're talking about poetry, we say stanzas, but you might have well, you know, you have the famous Spenserian stanza for the Fairy Queen. Uh, Tennyson's In Memoriam is a long poem written in four-line stanzas, and those stanzas rhyme A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C. So the stanza is a familiar thing. It's a nice little container um, for an idea or part of an idea as the poet works on it and then moves on to the next. But this poem is not written in stanzas. It's simply um, lines of verse that start and then eventually, about 20 lines later, finish. But there are no regular stanzas. And there is no set rhyme scheme. And the rhyme in this poem is really interesting because there's hardly any perfect rhymes in this poem, except for two exceptions. And I'll talk about those as we move on. But there are two places where Haney rhymes in this 20-odd line poem. Um, and then other than that, it's what you would call half rhymes, partial rhymes. And so when you look at it, you can see that um, it's no accident that the word endings are close. They're approximate, but, except, uh, but other than in two cases, they're not perfect rhymes. So we have sun and ripen. We have sweet and it. So you're getting the t, t even though the vowel sound is different. Four and hunger, pots and boots, drills and full. So he's got this pattern or this habit of half rhyming throughout the poem, partial rhymes. Um, and then there are these two points where there's a full couplet and a rhyme is delivered at two key moments. Uh, but there aren't stanzas. Instead, what there are are what we would call verse paragraphs. So when... A poet writes a number of lines, an irregular number of lines, not according to the formal pattern of a stanza, and then, so to speak, hits the enter key and begins a new section. We call those sections verse paragraphs if they're irregular. This gives a poem a little bit of a different, maybe more improvisational, conversational quality than you would get if you were writing in regular stanzas which quite suits the idea of going into one's memory for a moment in one's past to talk about it. Uh, so we have two verse paragraphs here. We have a longish one of maybe 14 or 16 lines, 
And then we have a second verse paragraph. So the first verse paragraph sets up the memory, the story, and its initial meaning starts to be hinted at. Uh, but we have the, the image of the children out in the fields picking blackberries. And then we have white space. That is actually a technical poem that critics of poetry use. It seems like it's just plotting literalism, and I guess it is. It's actual literal white space on the page. But it means that there is a gap, whether it's between two stanzas or two verse paragraphs, there's a gap on the page that, you know, it's obvious. Like I say, the enter key has been hit, or it's been hit twice, I should say. And poetry critics use the term white space to describe how in moving from one stanza to another or from one verse paragraph to another, things happen. We don't just pick up where we left off. And we'll see in this poem, it's almost like Heaney is, is it will, it, he finishes his initial setup and then we have a beat and then he's going to reflect more on the aftermath or he's going to describe the aftermath of the episode. And so in the white space, there's a kind of transition from hope to disappointment. And it's um, probably more than that, too. So we'll think a little bit about that. But, you know, the white space is important because it's telling us that something's happening between one piece of the poem and another. And I think Haney uses it again, with with simple artistry here. Um, He's not reinventing the wheel, but he knows when he's come to the end of that first verse paragraph, he's he's shifting his perspective. So let's take a look at the poem itself. I'll give it a read. Blackberry picking. Late August, given heavy rain and sun for a full week, the blackberries would ripen. At first, just one, a glossy purple clot among others, red, green, hard as a knot. You ate that first one, and its flesh was sweet, like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and a lust for picking. Then red ones inked up, and that hunger sent us out with milk cans, pea tins, jam pots, where briars scratched and wet grass bleached our boots. Round hay fields, corn fields, and potato drills, we trekked and picked until the cans were full, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, and on top dark, big dark blobs burn like a plate of eyes. Our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. We hoarded the fresh berries in the byre. But when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat-gray fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented. The sweet flesh would turn sour. I always felt like crying. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. So that's blackberry picking. So I'll kind of work through it and talk about what I see going on. And Eric may want to chip in and ask me to make myself clearer or uh, throw in an idea, something like that. But I'm just going to work top to bottom through the poem and then reflect on it a little bit and then touch that first passage I quoted when we began from, from one of Heaney's other poems, Death of a Naturalist. So late August... We begin abruptly. He pushes us into this memory of his. And the first words we're given are this time, late August. Uh, So we have this abrupt opening, almost as though we walked in and heard Haney on his therapist's couch or in his confessional box at church or in a private conversation Um, because we immediately come into this poem and we're sort of thrown into this moment. So we're in late August. Late August, of course, is a time of transition. The summer is dying in a northern latitude like Ireland or Canada, where I'm from, even if the days are hot in late, late August, 
The nights are getting cool and you can feel the wind changing and the uh, um, season is starting just gradually, just almost imperceptibly at first, but it's starting to turn. So late August, this time of transition is where we are. And he tells us that if conditions are right, that given heavy rain and sun for a full week, and you probably can't count on that every year, the blackberries would ripen in late August. So we're talking, um, as we so often are in this collection, about Haney's memories from his boyhood in the countryside. His father was an agricultural laborer. Probably his most famous poem, Digging, is about that subject. But we've got children who are ranging around the countryside and who realize that the blackberries are coming into ripeness. So in this short little window, they come into being, these little balls of juicy sweetness, better than a candy store, popping up on the hedges. He says at first, just one would be there, ripe and delectable, a glossy purple clot among others. I remember something similar because I grew up in uh, southern Ontario in the great nation of Canada. And um, we had, we grew up in the country and we had some raspberry canes on our property. And I remember in the summer walking by them from time to time and realizing, oh, the little green fruit is starting to grow. And then you'd see one that would be bright red and it would be edible because if you went in early and got one that was kind of only half red, didn't taste very good, but one or two would start fully mature. And then a few days later, all of them would have ripened. So maybe this poem is partly appealing to me because it resonates with, with a memory of my own. But he describes just one, he says, an individual blackberry that is ripened among the others that are not purple and that are not soft um, and that are not sweet. They are rather red, green, hard as a knot. So the one is ready and the one can be eaten. He says, you ate that first one and its flesh was sweet, like thickened wine, which is a wonderful simile, like thickened wine. Wine is the adult world. Wine is something that is beyond the reach of the child, something that really the child can only imagine, probably, unless his parents slip him a dose here and there. But wine is the promise of the adult world, and that single blackberry seems to be full of it. And then he goes on, summer's blood was in it, which is really interesting. Beautiful, powerful way to describe it. Fruit is ripe, and in a sense, fruit, fruit mostly, not all fruit, but most fruit, comes into ripeness, into maturity towards the end of the summer. And it's almost like the summer has been poured into the fruit. And the fruit is a kind of receptacle for the summer. But by saying summer's blood, Haney suggests, and the wine has this connotation also, something of the forbidden or of sin, blood and wine. They are sacramental, obviously, in the Christian tradition but they can also imply the forbidden or violence. And there is, you know, it does not take a lot of deep reading to see the presence of the Garden of Eden in this poem. And Genesis chapter 3, the fall, the idea of taking the fruit. The, women ta the woman takes the fruit, we're told, in Genesis chapter 3 and saw that it was good to eat. And so the child takes that first blackberry and savors it. Um, and it's exciting. And it seems to promise more. But it leaves stains upon the tongue and a lust for picking. So this is loaded language. It's suggesting that there is a kind of mark of guilt, perhaps. And that's not that Haney, of course, is saying that a child who's out there picking blackberries is doing anything sinful or anything to be guilty of. 
but that this experience will stand for other experiences that the child will have as he or she goes in to adulthood. Wanting one of these will make one want more. But how many is too many? And the, 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 the tongue is stained, as it would be naturally enough when a, when a dark, juicy fruit is eaten. But that also conveys a sense of, of being tainted or being marked out. Then he says the red one's inked up. In, in other words, berries that had been green turn red, and then berries that have been red turn that glossy purple-black color that we know so well. You know, we, we buy them in plastic in the supermarkets. But if you're growing up in Northern Ireland in the middle of the 20th century, you're probably not eating your blackberries in supermarkets flown in from Chile at whatever time of the year you like. They're coming into season for this tiny little window. And unless you have a mother or a grandmother who's going to make them into jam, um, you're not going to hold on to them. They're going to be here and then they're going to be gone. And the idea of buying them whenever you please at two ninety nine a pound is not an option. So this little window is open and the berries are starting to ink up. They're starting to get to that dark, dark color that we associate with a ripe blackberry. And he says this sent, that hunger sent us out. That hunger sent us out. The collective is emphasized here. Some of the poems in this collection emphasize the individual, the personal. It's Haney's particular memory of himself and, and something he's done. Death of a Naturalist is like that. But this poem says us, his friends, all of them go out because this Blackberry window has now opened and they want to gorge on them. They have hunger. And so we see them going out um, in their scuffed up boots through the wet grass with their various receptacles, milk cans, pea tins, jam pots. And they go out foraging for blackberries where briars scratched, he says. And he'll come back to that towards the end of the verse paragraph. But um, their hands are getting nicked up, scratched up, blood on the hands, echoing in its own way that image of the stained tongue. Again, perfectly innocent. A child gets a little bit scratched up foraging for blackberries. There's nothing wrong with it, of course. But it's part of this larger complex of experiences that the child has as he begins to know the world better and yet feel more alienated from the world at the same time. So we go round hayfields, cornfields, and potato drills. They pick and they pick the blackberries until their cans were full. And then he gives an odd description, until the tinkling bottom had been covered with green ones, almost as though when they first go out into the fields to start looking for the blackberries, they're picking um, immature berries that aren't ready yet to be eaten, but they can't help it. And so initially they throw some green ones into the pails also. But then the abundance of the ripened fruit means they no longer have to do that. Um, and so on top, big dark blobs burned like a plate of eyes. That's an alienating and, or that's the wrong word, that's an unsettling way to describe um, a fruit that is very appetizing. I don't think you meet very many people who don't like blackberries. To describe a pile of blackberries as like a plate full of eyes might put someone off their food, though. It's gross, not to put too fine a point on it. And it's gruesome. And it again suggests guilt in a way. Those eyes looking at you, perhaps as you carry them around. Those eyes um, suggesting you've done an act that's perhaps kind of a criminal violation in picking them. This is driven home in the next line and a half. As I said, he, he reverts back to the briars that's, that have scratched them up. He says, our hands were peppered with thorn pricks, our palms sticky as bluebeards. 
So the bloodstained hands, again, it's just, you know, they're just a little bit scratched up because of the thorns. But he says they're as sticky as bluebeards. Bluebeard uh, is a figure from the French folk tradition. The story of Blue, Bluebeard is a kind of arresting fairy tale about um, a rich man who lives in a great house and who marries. He's a sort of serial, he, he marries in serial fashion a number of beautiful young village girls, but they all disappear. And so he has to then marry again. And so his last wife, he marries this young woman who's afraid and he has to leave and he tells her, you can go anywhere in the house, but don't go into, I don't know, the sub basement or whatever. And she does. And she finds the bodies of his earlier wives. He almost kills her, but she's saved. And he, in fact, is killed. And I think at least the most famous version of the folk story, but our hands were as sticky as bluebeards. Why does Bluebeard come up here? Bluebeard, who seemed to want to reach for too much and take too much. Bluebeard, who is a figure of um, the sort of dark, uncomfortable borderline between violence and sexuality. Bluebeard is maybe what every man has in him, potentially, if it's not checked. That runaway desire that can end in violence and so Haney does not come right out and say, of course, it would be an empty poem if he did, and also a false poem if he suggested. It's not as though these children are guilty little blue be bluebeards, but their hands are as sticky. They're as sticky as what? A kid with berries on his hands? No, as sticky as bluebeards. It's just hinting at the idea of a kind of dark experience that's or, or or dark truth that is contained in this experience this experience that is innocent in that these children aren't doing anything objectively wrong and don't have anything to apologize for and yet are being exposed to something that is connected to the kind of torturous fact of human desire and where it often takes us and so this is the end of the first verse paragraph. And now what I mentioned, that white space follows there. We can see it on the page, Eric, about um, three quarters of an inch tall between the two verse paragraphs. It's ominous that Bluebeard is the note that the first verse paragraph ends on. And then Haney allows the reader of the poem to catch his breath. But now we have transitioned from the open field into what he calls the byre, the cow shed. The children come back with their berries, like contemporary American children coming back loaded up with Halloween candy. They come back and they kind of want to count the tape. And so he describes a bath, an old bath, an old, old fashioned bathtub, I suppose that's in the buyer that they then dump their spoils into. They dump the pails of blackberries into this bath. But immediately, he says, when the bath was filled, we found a fur, a rat gray fungus glutting on our cash. The juice was stinking too. So they have come back with these berries and pile them up only to then realize they've already begun to spoil. Blackberries, of course, are like this. We got some on the weekend, and I kind of smiled because I knew we'd be talking about this poem. We got some on the weekend that seemed to be good for about six hours. And, you, you know, between when you pick them out at the supermarket and kind of look, look at, the, at the plastic case and think they look pretty decent, and then... Um, you're back in the fridge a few hours later and they just look like muck. So blackberries are like this, but almost immediately they've spoiled. And of course, not all of the berries need have spoiled, but if some of them start getting mold on them or start stinking, all of them are going to be as good as worthless. The juice was stinking too. The way he describes the growth of the mold or fungus on the berries is deliberately unappealing, a rat gray fungus. 
glutting on our catch, glutting. Um, glutting is like an animal that is eating ravenously, filling itself. So it's as though nature has become very aggressive and predatory here in retaking these berries, taking them back from the children. And the juice is stinking too. And he explains. He explains, and it's almost as though the adult is explaining what the, um, to the child what the child doesn't quite understand or doesn't want to understand, just like the adult has to explain to the child uh, when the Halloween candy is there on the floor, that if you have um, if you have six hundred packs of Skittles tonight, like you want to, you will feel sick. The adult voice seems to explain here: once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh would turn sour. So that's something we all understand. That happens with fruit. It happens especially quickly with some fruit. But it's the tone here of adult explanation that is factually accurate and yet doesn't touch the experience in full. It doesn't get to the heart of the experience for the child because the child would want to know why. We have these things. We've collected these things. I want to eat them. And the adult voice that tells him, well, when it's been picked, et cetera, et cetera, does not satisfy. Again, think of the Garden of Eden. Once off the bush, the fruit fermented, the sweet flesh would turn sour. Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and the fruit that was good to the taste becomes sour, not literally, but because of its effects for them. The sweet flesh, the flesh not only of the fruit, but their flesh that is sweet, that is deathless, that is immortal, that is made for perpetual joy, turns sour because death comes in once that fruit has been eaten. So there's something here of a kind of primordial guilt that human beings discover as they grow. Whether, it's, whether you want to think it's um, guilt that's deserved or proper or not, the feeling of the world not being okay, and maybe of me not being okay, is something that most of us discover before too long and have to come to terms with. The adult voice can say, once off the bush, the fruit fermented, using a word that a child would not use, the sweet flesh would turn sour. The child, though, is Heaney in the next line, he says, I always felt like crying. That's the child who's not content that the fruit once off the bush would ferment. And he says, he, he, he makes that quintessential child's statement in the second half of the line, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. It's not fair that it should be that way. It's not fair that the thing I reach for, the thing I want, which is not a bad thing in itself, Nothing wrong with having berries. It's not fair that as I reach for it, it should turn to ashes, or in this case, to fermented muck. It's not fair. And so he ends the poem in the following two lines. It wasn't fair that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. So this is one of those two rhymes I mentioned, full rhymes rather than half rhymes. He ends the poem with a rhyme, rhyming rot with not. Now, as I said, it's the second time he's rhymed in the poem. The first time comes in lines three and four. And what are the rhyming words, Eric, if you don't mind? It would be clot and not. Yes, clot and not spelled with a K, K-N-O-T. What uh, do the rhymes clot and not, rot and not have in common? Notice it's the same rhymes, it's the same word sounds in each case. He's only, he's only rhymed twice in the poem. And in both times, it's that, it's that sound of negation, the not sound. And um, that's no accident. Notice the first pair of rhymed lines 
set up the experience of the initial blackberry being eaten, taken, at first just one, a glossy purple clot, among others, red, green, hard as a knot. And then the second rhyme that closes the poem sort of shows the outcome, the disappointed outcome of the experience that the first rhyme clot not begins. All the lovely canfuls smelt of rot. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. So he's not doing this by accident in a poem full of half rhymes to signal that strong ought rhyme twice. It's happening at key moments. And notice the last line, which is so powerful. Each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. The children do this, who knows, maybe by the time he's 13 years old or something, he's off to school, I don't know, and and, um, he leaves this experience behind him. But for several summers in a row, he's gone out with his friends in quest of these blackberries. And it's not just at this age that he's disappointed by the outcome, because the berries ferment and rot. It's that he knows that's going to happen that he knows that he can't make good, if you like, on this anticipation, on this promise, on this ambition. There is where I think the deepest poignancy or the most piercing poignancy in the poem comes, is not just that the child is disappointed, but that the child lives in the light, in the knowledge of disappointment. The child is a human being, so the child is going to strive in any event. In spite of that knowledge, he's going to go questing for his blackberries in the hopes that he'll get a greater share this year at least, or maybe get to have all he wants. But there's the knowledge that it won't be that way. And so the berries turn sour at the end of the poem. And at the same time, the memory of picking them has now gone sour also. And it becomes a memory of a disappointment. And in no trivial sense, it's a small disappointment. Childhood, of course, is full of these moments and we remember them. We remember when something we wanted did not satisfy in the way we hoped. We remember when a toy on Christmas morning seems a lot smaller and less colorful and enticing once it's been unwrapped than than as it's in your imagination. We remember uh, the feeling of a looked-for experience, a party or something like that that we can't wait to go to, uh, that we're counting down the days to, not failing to deliver once we actually get there. And it's not that every experience fails to deliver. Some of them do, and childhood is also full of the ones that do. But the ones that don't maybe stick in the mind longer, are rooted more deeply, because they tell us an uncomfortable truth about the world. So there's blackberry picking. That was amazing. I mean, <laughs> had, I re- had I read that just on my own, I would have gone through it and thought, huh, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, or you you maybe would get it as a snapshot of an experience. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. The the kind of, uh, apply, you know, it's like applying several layers of paint stripper to something, right? Like the, yeah. to, to finally get down there and see the, the, the actual grain of the wood. And uh, yeah, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes with poetry. But it is like, that's part of the genius of this poem. And it's true of, of a number of others in this collection is that it is such a simple experience, but it's so loaded. Um, and he's got the gift, as you see in that final couplet, that all the lovely canfuls smelt of rot each year I hoped they'd keep, knew they would not. In just two lines, 20 syllables, he can compress so much meaning and content. And there it is. And it's it's powerful because I don't know if you could call it a universal experience, but it's got to be pretty close to universal. The child recognizing that the world is darker and maybe further away 
from him than he hopes that things turn sour. So, yeah, um, I think uh, I think we can all, in our different ways, understand that one. Yeah, in this in this topic too, uh, this theme is kind of near and dear to me. I mean, I think okay. it is for everybody, but I've kind of picked it up from from other mediums and, and plays and movies, some other books and stuff like that, where there's that that crossing over period mm-hmm. where you're not completely aware that you are crossing over. That's right. Until you until you look back yeah. years later. Yeah. So d- does Haney have any other poems that, that follow this theme or similar? Yeah. Again, um, not knowing his catalog um, in immense detail, the poems in Death of a Naturalist, his first volume, certainly a number of them explore this territory. And the poem, I, I, I began the episode by reading the first half of his poem, Death of a Naturalist, which, as I say, is what the whole collection was also named for. And it's it's interesting because it's about the same subject, but it feels to me it's about maybe a more severe and unsettling episode uh, that maybe happens reflecting a little bit of a later stage of development. So why does he call the collection Death of a Naturalist? Well, you begin the poem and you assume it's going to tell the grisly story of some naturalist falling into an alpine crevasse or being eaten by a a grizzly bear or something like that. But the naturalist who dies in the poem is Haney. And the death of the naturalist is not the physical death of the naturalist, but it's about a young man who learns that he does not want to be a naturalist. Um, And it's because he has an experience that shakes him. It's another memory from growing up in the countryside in County Derry. It's another summer memory. It's another memory like blackberry picking of a boy going out to try to collect something in a way that's very innocent, just like a young boy would do. In the case of death of a naturalist, the something he's going to collect is frog spawn. He's going to a flax dam, which is a piece of swampy land where the plant flax would be weighed down under sods, piled up and weighed down under sods for several weeks or months even, so that it would be softened by the water and could then be turned into textiles, turned into cloth. But this is a good place to look for frogs. Um, And having been a boy myself, I remember the idea of looking for frogs was appealing. And so he um, would go to this place in the flax dam where there would be thick frog spawn. So that jelly-like, well, that jelly that's um, on the top of the water where the frogs have laid their eggs. And as he says in the passage I read, You could scoop it up in jars and put it on the windowsill and you would see the eggs hatch into tadpoles and then the tadpoles would grow into frogs. I read the first half of this poem, which is the innocent half. I didn't read the second half, even though it might have been more pointed for me to have done that, but it's a disturbing passage because he talks about how one day he went to the flax dam looking for the frog spawn, and he came a little bit early. He came when the frogs were in full-throated copulation. And a big bullfrog is a fairly large animal, and when you get a bunch of them together, and they're croaking and bellowing, and when you're a child who doesn't understand fully where babies come from, You might have the kind of experience Haney describes, an experience of fear and revulsion and of running away. And that's the death of the naturalist. That's when he decides, he doesn't exactly say it, but we infer it. He's not not going to be spending his life collecting frog spawn and taking it back to the lab. He's seen a side of the natural world that is too much for him. And in the first verse paragraph I read, He talks about going to collect this jelly. He talks about putting it in jars to watch the frogs grow. It seems like magic, right? Um, He's seen the second half of the procreative act. The egg is there and it grows and hatches. Um, It's only later in the poem he sees the first half and is disturbed by it. But towards the end of the section I read at the top of the episode, we meet Miss Walls, his teacher. 
And she speaks condescendingly to the children in her class. And I guess that's what a teacher has to do when you're with a bunch of eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds or whatever they are. You're not going to, you're not going to get the whiteboard out and really draw things with a lot of precision, especially in Ireland in the mid-20th century. And so Miss Walls would tell us how the daddy frog was called a bullfrog and how he croaked and how the mammy frog laid hundreds of little eggs and this was frog spawn. But there's something Miss Walls doesn't tell them. And he only discovers that uh, when he goes back to the flax dam another time and sees the whole thing heaving with frogs. And he uses words about, he uses words like obscene. He compares the frogs to, as he calls it, mud grenades. Um, and so it's almost like he's walked into a minefield, a place that's rippling with kind of power and virility, and it scares him. Blackberry picking, I like. They're both wonderful, powerful poems. I like black blackberry picking more, I think, maybe for a couple of different reasons. Um, you know, his, his description of those frogs when they're in the middle of things is, is a little bit harrowing. Um, but um, I like blackberry picking because I think it's a slightly younger boy he's talking about. An experience that's not so directly loaded with sexuality, where that's just implicit. And it allows the poem to be about that, I think, deeper but more general disappointment with life and its broken promises that it makes to us. Or maybe it's not fair to accuse life of breaking the promises. Maybe we expect too much for, from it. But yeah, for anyone who has ever saved up their money to buy a toy only to have the toy break or look forward all summer to going camping only to have it rain and for dad to be upset and angry and not able to get the fire lit. In other words, everyone. Um, then there's something in blackberry picking and in this volume of poetry, I think, that might be for you. Yeah, I really like the whole concept of thinking of it as uh, you're crossing a line and you can't go back to it. You can, you'll never be able to go back. That's right. The, the two cherubs with drawn swords guard the gates of Eden, right? right. And we're not allowed back to that innocence. But as kids... We are, we're charging for that. Yeah. We're headed to that line. We want to get out of there. We're that's like, good. we're all about progressing, going forward. Mm -hmm. There's so much to look forward to. But then there's, you know, we get down to we cross the line and it's somewhere along there. Things are different. Yeah. And like I said before, it's only then with, you know, some years and some hindsight that you realize, oh, I see what, I see what's happening. Yeah, that's true, right? Like the adult the healthy adult, at least, to the extent that any of us are ever really healthy, um, but some of us are healthier than others, the healthy adult is able to kind of not compartmentalize. I don't think that would be healthy, not to compartmentalize that disappointment, but to rather sort of network or wire that site of disappointment into a larger picture of the world and an understanding of it. And maybe even to value it, um, not just in a kind of cynical sense of this is the moment that taught me that existence is a cruel joke. I don't mean anything like that. But to understand the way in which the sour is mingled with the sweet and that loss is mingled with joy and to be okay walking forward because someone who is going to be a healthy adult who's any good at all to the people around him is going to need to do that. But in Blackberry Picking, Haney is capturing a moment where the child doesn't have those resources at that point to even understand that one day he will be able to appreciate an experience like this, but is just kind of leveled with the sheer fact of it. Like an adult can say, not only, you know, an adult can be a jerk and say, kid, it's not the end of the world. They'll be back next year. I'll, I'll buy you some damn blackberries. But a wise adult could say something like, if all you ate was blackberries, you would get sick of them. Or even better, say something like, the very fact that the blackberry 
is temporary, that it's, that it's only a sometimes thing, makes it precious. You know, again, that's, that's something we have trouble relating to because we can go to a supermarket and spend $20 and buy more blackberries in 15 minutes than young Seamus Haney would have eaten in his whole childhood. Uh, we are so spoiled. But if you don't have that option, then there becomes, then, then the fact that the blackberries come along for a few days in late August, and if you don't get them in a pie or, a jam, or, or in your jam, you won't have any again for a year. That makes them precious. There's something sweeter and richer about them because of that. But that's the perspective that only time maturity can produce. And it's no good, as those of us who have children know, it's no good on the front end trying to explain to the child in the moment how, uh, how the passage of time right. uh, will... Uh, will level them out. Um, he has caught, he has caught his young self here at this moment where not only is he sort of disappointed, but where the disappointment seems to, to say something about the tragedy of life. I, I thought it was, it's a pheno phenomenal poem and somebody who doesn't, like I said, read a whole lot of poetry. And I probably read, read more when I was younger, but mm -hmm. Uh, I think this, uh, and I'm not just saying it just because we're doing a show about it, but it's probably moved into the number one spot of my favorite poem. Oh, top ever. of the rotation. Yes. yes. All right. Well, good. We'll see if we can top it in the next couple of months with something else. But yeah, it's a, it's a good one and it deserves to be read. It's one of those that sort of sat on my mind over the last few months. So I'm glad to get the chance to talk about it. Well, thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Eric. I do believe we're at the end of an episode, more or yeah. less. So, dear listeners, we uh, look forward to hearing from you when we actually start releasing podcasts. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, for Eric Williams, this is David Anderson thanking you for sticking with us and with Seamus Haney. And we will be back soon. And I believe the tentative plan right now is that we will be back in the company of George Orwell. So, all the best. Thank you.